Hey everyone, welcome to another episode of Great Leadership. Today's podcast is going to be with just me. So I'm going to be sharing some insights, some research, some things from my new book, Leading with Vulnerability, in the hopes that it will entice you to grab a copy of the book for yourself and even for your teams. You can learn more about the book by going to leadwithvulnerability.com. And I just happen to have a hardcover copy of the book right next to me here. So if you're watching this instead of listening to it, that's what the book looks like. I actually just got this in the mail a couple of days ago, it was. And it's a beautiful cover. Uh, we've got the Adam Grant endorsement on the front cover. On the back, we have endorsements from Seth Godin, Patrick Lencioni, Amy Edmondson, Chef Robert Irvine, uh, Michael uh, Maybach, the CEO of MasterCard, Mel Robbins, Kathy Warden, the president and CEO of Northrop Grumman, and Frank Blake, the former chairman and CEO of the Home Depot. So those are some of the people who endorsed the book. The CEO of Hyatt also endorsed the book too. It is with the index around 270 pages or so. There's a lot of frameworks and models and a lot of unique concepts in that book. I am so incredibly excited to share this with you. Very proud of this book. Definitely the hardest book I have ever written. And so today, what I want to do is to give you a little bit of a sneak peek of some of the concepts from the book, some of the research that went into it. We're going to share a couple stories and we will go over uh, some of the frameworks. I'll tease out some of the frameworks. Obviously, I'm not going to go through a 270 page book in uh, 45 minutes, but it will at least give you enough information so that you can understand why I don't believe that vulnerability is what anybody should be doing inside of their organizations and why leading with vulnerability is a different concept, different idea, and the right approach. So having said that, uh, let's get right into today's episode with me, your host, yours truly, Jacob Morgan, where I will be sharing some insights about leading with vulnerability. And one more plug for the book. Remember, leadwithvulnerability.com if you decide to grab a copy for yourself. And let me know what you think after listening to this episode. I'm very curious to hear your thoughts. You can email me, jacob at thefutureorganization.com. And if you do grab a copy of the book, let me know. Send me that email. Tell me you grabbed a copy of the book. I will send you some cool bonuses that you can access as well. All right, that's it. Let's get right into this episode on leading with vulnerability. First of all, thank you so much for joining. Obviously, if you're listening to this, if you're watching this, you were one of the many, many uh, people who purchased the book around the world. And I've been trying to coordinate a lot of different time zones with people around the world. So as I mentioned, we've had some big groups, some small groups. Today, it looks like we get a smaller group, but you know what? Uh, that's totally okay and fine with me. And um, we're gonna be talking about some of the concepts <clears throat> and the ideas from the new book before it comes out, which is gonna be in two weeks. And really today I wanna introduce some of the high level themes and then spend the rest of the time asking your, uh, answering your questions if you have them. Um, so I wanna give a little bit of context first with the book and where this idea actually came from. And the original genesis from this actually came from two places. <clears throat> so first, uh, it came from my last book. So when I wrote The Future Leader, it came out in 2020. And for that book, I interviewed 140 CEOs. And when I interviewed that book, I noticed that the theme of vulnerability was coming up a lot. The theme of emotional intelligence was coming up a lot. But at the same time, what these executives were telling me was that they were challenged in two different areas. One is they weren't sure what their employees wanted from them in the sense that on the one hand, employees wanted their leaders to be competent and confident and strong and visionary and be able to uh, get them out of a tough spot. And at the same time, the employees wanted their leaders to be vulnerable, to talk about feelings and emotions and problems and challenges and failures and obstacles. And so one of the challenges that a lot of leaders shared with me was, how am I supposed to reconcile these two seemingly opposing perspectives? On the one hand, my employees want me to be strong and competent and this you know, visionary leader. And on the other hand, I'm supposed to be talking about my feelings and challenges and obstacles and failures. The second um, thing, the second piece of feedback that I heard from a lot of these leaders 
was also that they knew what vulnerability was. They understood the power and the value of vulnerability, especially in their personal lives. In fact, we all know what it feels like to be vulnerable. And we also all know the value of vulnerability in our personal lives. For example, with friends, with family members, uh, with those who are close to you. However, I started to wonder when I was interviewing a lot of these executives, is it really just that simple inside of our organizations? In other words, can you just take vulnerability the way it's applied in our personal lives and apply it to our work lives and expect to have that same result of connection and that same result of trust? And the answer is no, because we need to remember that inside of our organizations, we have a very different dynamic. You have a hierarchy, you have a boss, you have people who might work for you, you have deadlines, customers, employees, there's the issue of money. It's a very different environment. So vulnerability in our personal lives is not quite the same as it is inside of our organizations. The second thing that was also very interesting for me is that vulnerability for leaders is not the same as it is for everybody else. And I'll share a story uh, about that in just a minute. But if you think about it, let's say you're running a team or a function or a business. Vulnerability for you is not the same as it is for everybody else because you're actually responsible for the lives of other people now and you're responsible for the fiscal aspect of a business. So that's kind of one piece of where this theme <clears throat> of leading with vulnerability came from. The second actually came from my family. And uh, I actually just gave a copy of the book to my dad yesterday and he called me this morning as he was reading it and he's like, wow, you're, you're sharing a lot of uh, family and personal stuff in there. And uh, the reason he said that is because my parents came from the Republic of Georgia, the former USSR. And as much as my mom tried to model emotional openness and vulnerability, I grew up as a young boy watching my dad. Um, he's in the picture here you can see um, with me and my mom many, many years ago. And my dad did not believe in vulnerability. Don't show your emotion. Don't talk about feelings. Nobody cares about your problems. Don't share your failures or your mistakes. None of that stuff. And as a young boy, I grew up emulating and watching my dad. So I too did not believe in vulnerability. I thought there was no place for it in my life. I thought there was no place for it, especially when I'm working with other people. And that's how I lived and operated for the majority of my entire adult life. And a pivotal moment for me happened a few years ago. And I was standing in my bathroom. I was brushing my teeth. It was around seven in the morning. And all of a sudden I started to feel really weird. And my heart started racing out of its chest. Uh, it was 130, 140 beats per minute just standing there brushing my teeth. My vision became blurry. Uh, I was overcome with this fear of panic and dread. And I thought that I'm having a heart attack. I thought that's it. I'm gonna die right here on my bathroom floor and goodbye. And long story short, uh, this was also during the holidays. This was also in the middle of the pandemic. So I couldn't get in to see my doctor. And this was going on like this for a couple of days. And I had no idea what's going on. I'm sitting there thinking I'm dying. Uh, I can't get in to go see a doctor. Finally, I do get in to go see a doctor and the doctor looks at me and says, you know what? Your heart is totally fine. We did some tests, we ran some scans. There's no problems with you but you might wanna go see a different kind of doctor, intimating that I should go obviously see a therapist. So there I am talking to a therapist and after a couple of sessions, it became very clear what was causing these panic attacks. And what was causing them was the very fact that I had committed to writing a book about vulnerability when I myself did not believe in and did not practice vulnerability in my own life. And <clears throat> the panic attacks happened shortly after I signed the contract for this book. So the very fact that I committed to writing a book about vulnerability actually gave me a series of panic attacks. That just goes to show how foreign vulnerability is to me and how foreign it is in my life. Um, so again, the basic question that I wanted to answer is, is vulnerability for leaders the same as it is for everybody else? And obviously if the answer for that uh, was gonna be yes, I wouldn't have a book. And so I began my journey of researching I interviewed over 100 CEOs at companies around the world. And I also partnered with leadership firm DDI and we surveyed 14,000 employees around the world. And what became abundantly clear from all the conversations I was having is that no, if you're a leader, if you're inside of an organization, vulnerability for you is not the same as it is for everybody else. Now I wanna illustrate this with a couple different stories. 
So one comes from Hollis Harris. Some of you might remember Hollis Harris, but I'm willing to bet that a lot of you probably have no idea who he is. He was the former CEO of Continental Airlines. And when Hollis Harris was the CEO of Continental Airlines, there was a period of time where the airline was really struggling. And in the early 90s, Hollis Harris was asked to send a memo to his workforce. And he wrote this memo, he sends it out. And in the memo, he acknowledges that the company is going through a tough time. He acknowledges that the um, economic landscape is not favorable for their business, for the airline industry. He also acknowledges that he's not sure how to turn things around. He talks about the challenges, but he doesn't really say, I have a plan for how to get out of this. And then at the very end of the memo, he says that the best thing that employees can do is to pray for the future of the company. The next day, Hollis Harris was fired. Now, this story was told to me by Doug Parker, who is the former chairman and CEO of American Airlines. And what Doug correctly pointed out to me is he said that what Hollis Harris did was vulnerable, but there was no leadership. And Keep in mind that if Hollis was a junior employee, he was Hollis in accounting or Hollis in marketing, and he came forward and shared some of these things, chances are somebody would have said, oh, you know what? It sounds like you're having a bad day. Maybe you're having a tough time. Why don't you take some time off, come back tomorrow, and you'll be just fine. But when you're the CEO of an organization and you do that, you cause chaos and you cause pandemonium. So that's an example of being vulnerable. Now, let's contrast that to another story that I have in my book, which is from Fleetwood Grobler. And Fleetwood Grobler, he's the CEO of a company called Sassel. It is a South African energy company. They have around 30,000 employees around the world. And when Fleetwood took over as CEO, the company was 13 billion, with a B, billion dollars in debt. And he too was asked to address his workforce. But the message he gave was very different. Now, he started off with the vulnerability. He started off by saying, uh, I, I acknowledge and I understand that the company is going through a tough time, that the economic landscape is not in our favor, that we do have a huge uh, mountain that we need to climb that's ahead of us. So he talked about all the, the challenges that are in, in their way. But then he said, I have a vision of where I think our business can go. I believe in our employees and I know that we can rebuild trust in the eyes of our customers and in the eyes of our people who work here. And if you come with me on this journey and if you help me achieve this vision, if you help me get to this idea, this plan that I have in my head, then I know we can turn things around and become successful. And that's exactly what they did. Now, the difference is what Fleetwood did was he was vulnerable, but he also added the leadership piece. So that is the concept of leading with vulnerability, which is what we're gonna talk about for the rest of the day today. Now, let me give you a couple of practical examples of this. Vulnerability, um, a, a couple signs of vulnerability, right? When we talk about vulnerability, what do we say? Well, we should create a safe space where your employees can go and talk about mistakes, they could talk about uh, uncertainty, they could talk about challenges or failures. The way that we think about vulnerability Brene Brown defined it as risk, uncertainty, and emotional exposure. We could also think about it as doing, saying, or facing something that exposes you to the potential of emotional harm. That's vulnerability, right? So classic example, you admit to a mistake. You give me a project to do, you give me a deadline, I do it, I screw it up. And then I come to you and I say, I am so sorry. I know you gave me this project, I made a mistake. That's vulnerable. But where's the leadership? Leading with vulnerability, on the other hand, would say, I know you gave me this project. I'm so sorry I made a mistake, but here's what I learned from the mistake that I made. And here are three things that I'm gonna gonna do going forward to make sure that that mistake does not happen again. That's leading with vulnerability. And so the definition of a vulnerable leader that I propose in the book is a leader who intentionally exposes themselves to the potential of emotional harm, that's vulnerability, while taking action to create a positive outcome. That's the leadership, the action, taking action to create a positive outcome. Now, the reason why this is important is because we have to take a step back and consider the relationship that an employee has with an organization. So why are you working at your organization? Well, because the company at some point said, we need help. We have a job opening, we have a project, we have a series of tasks, we have a role that we need to fill, and we need somebody who has that certain set of skills and mindsets and who can do the things that we need help with. And at a certain point, you or 
somebody else says, I can do that. I have those skills. I know what you need. I'm good at it. Bring me in. And so the company brings this person in and the job begins. Now, in that situation, what happens if you keep showing up to work every day being vulnerable? You keep showing up to work saying, I need help. I'm sorry. I made a mistake. I'm going through a tough time. I can't do this. I can't do that. Eventually, what's going to happen is your leaders and your peers and everyone around you is going to look at you and say, hey, wait a minute. When we brought you in, you said you were capable. You said that you were competent. You said you could do these things. And now it seems like you kind of can't. And you're starting to use your vulnerability as a way to justify poor performance, which is oftentimes what we see in a lot of organizations. So vulnerability is not a crutch to justify poor performance. And this is why I don't advocate for anybody to simply be vulnerable all the time at work. Instead, I'm a believer in leading with vulnerability, which again is adding the leadership piece to vulnerability. I made a mistake, but here's what I learned. Here's what I'm going to do going forward to make sure this doesn't happen again. I need help, but here's what I'm going to do in the future to make sure that I can solve my own problems. I have a team that I work with as well, and I, I make a lot of mistakes. My team makes a lot of mistakes. And we get in the habit of leading with vulnerability. So when someone on my team makes a mistake and they say, I'm sorry, my bad, I shouldn't have done that. I always say, what did you learn from that? How are we going to make sure that mistake doesn't happen again? Somebody comes to me. They say, Jacob, I need help. I'm happy to help. But what are you going to do going forward to make sure that you can solve your own problem? So leading with vulnerability is this idea that you can be vulnerable, but you also need to demonstrate that you are trying to close that gap. You're trying to become more competent. You're trying to solve that problem. You're trying to get better and learn and grow. If you don't do that, that's when a lot of the challenges start to arise. Now, again, this is the definition of a vulnerable leader, a leader who intentionally opens themselves up to the potential of emotional harm, but while taking action to create that positive outcome. It's that action that I think we oftentimes forget inside of our organizations. So the premise of the book, the whole foundation, is based on this equation. I call it the vulnerable leader equation. Vulnerability plus leadership equals vulnerable leadership or leading with vulnerability. Vulnerability is connection. Leadership is competence, being good at your job. And together, those things allow you to be good at your job, connect with people. That, to me, is the foundational aspect of great leadership. And that is what was reflected in the interviews that I did and in the 14,000 employees that I surveyed. Now, um, I mentioned that we did survey 14,000 employees in partnership with DDI. And DDI does their annual uh, state of leadership report. And interestingly enough, one of the things that was looked at was the frequency of effective leadership behaviors. So when looking at the most effective leaders in today's business world, what do the most effective leaders do? What are the behaviors that they exhibit and how frequently do they exhibit them? How good are they at exhibiting these things? Now, if you notice, there are 13 um, different behaviors. And so when you grab the book, you'll see those 13. Uh, I'll be sharing some of these things online as well in the coming weeks and months. There are 13 of them. Now, I won't go through all 13 of them, but one of the things that I found fascinating is how the emerging ones versus the traditional ones rank differently. So I'll give you an example. Number one on the list is maintaining high trust and confidentiality. That's something that we are doing all the time, right? I mean, it's a typical aspect of traditional leadership. Just can you keep a secret? Um, can you, uh, if something is confidential that's shared with you, can you not tell anybody about it? Can you keep that trust and confidentiality? That's basic stuff. Another one is sharing your rationale for a thought or a decision. So you made a decision and basically explaining why did I make that decision? Again, table stakes. These are basic aspects of leadership. And this is what I would consider some of the traditional aspects of leadership, things that have always been relevant. Um, things like being able to give people opportunities to learn and grow if they're doing a good job, uh, right? Again, these are traditional things that have been around for a while. But what's also interesting is the emerging attributes and specifically those related to vulnerability. So the two that, link, that ranked lowest on the list were genuinely acknowledging your failures and shortcomings. 
And very last on the list was showing a willingness to be emotionally vulnerable. Less than a third of um, leaders who are very effective in their organizations, less than a third of them are able to do that. So it's a very, very shockingly low statistic that we're so good at the traditional aspects of leadership, but we really struggle with the emerging aspects of leadership. Now, we broke this down by individual contributors, managers, mid-level leaders, and then also senior level leaders. And what we saw was pretty su uh, surprising across the board. As you go from manager to mid-level manager to senior level leader, what we start to see is a drop in your emerging um leadership behaviors, right? Kind of the, the, the leading with vulnerability, the acknowledging failures or shortcomings, we see a drop in that. And we see a relatively steady um, uh, rate of how well and how frequently we're practicing those traditional leadership behaviors. But I think more shockingly is when we look at specifically a showing willingness to be emotionally vulnerable, just that one specific, a specific attribute it's very surprising and shocking when we broke this down across leadership attributes. Because as an individual contributor, from manager to mid-level leader to senior level leader, the more senior you become, the less comfortable you are and the less willing you are to be emotionally vulnerable at work. And the considerable drop, so it's a gradual decline, but as you go from mid-level leader to senior level leader, that's when we see a massive drop from 29% to 13%. So imagine just 13% of senior level leaders are willing to show emo emotional vulnerability at work. That's a staggeringly low, low statistic. So clearly there's something going on here where we are not comfortable with vulnerability inside of our organizations. Now, again, um, I am not an advocate or a proponent um, of simply being vulnerable at work. And I just want to make sure that everybody understands that. I don't believe you should just be vulnerable at work all the time. You need to lead with vulnerability. You have to work on closing that gap. You have to work on closing that gap. Demonstrate what you're doing to try to become better, to learn, to grow, to become more competent. And we'll talk a little bit more about this in just a minute. Now, ultimately the question at first becomes, well, why should I be doing this? And I wanna look at this in terms of value from two different perspectives. One is value to you as an individual, and the second is value to the business. So let's start with value to you. Why should you personally be doing this? And to answer that question, we turn to the story of the Edith Checker Spot butterfly which used to make Nevada its home. So it was very uh, prominent, it was flourishing in Nevada, and it did so for many, many years, until one day, humans came into the picture. And before humans came into the picture, the Edith Checker Spot butter uh, butterfly very much relied on a particular type of plant to survive called the Blue-Eyed Mary. When humans came into the picture, they brought cattle with them, they settled in the area, and along with cattle, they brought a new invasive species of grass called ribwort plantain. And what happened over time is that this new species of grass took over the blue-eyed Mary. And so what happened is the butterfly had to adapt. They had to move from being dependent on, on the blue-eyed Mary to being dependent on the ribwort plantain. And everything was fine and dandy for years until suddenly in a short period of time, the humans abruptly took off and left, and they took their cattle with them. And as the humans and the cattle left, the ribwort plantain died off, and the blue-eyed Mary once again took over. But unfortunately, the change happened so quickly that the butterfly was unable to adapt this time, and they all died off. Now, the story has a happy ending because butterflies from nearby fields were able to come and repopulate the area. But this is an inter interesting concept known as mismatch theory. And mismatch theory basically states that attributes and behaviors that were once beneficial to you become detrimental to you when your environment around you suddenly changes. In the case of the butterfly, the environment suddenly changed and the dependency on ribwort plantain actually came back to hurt and kill the butterfly. I think we're seeing the exact same thing in the world of leadership. 
it used to be okay and it used to be expected and respected and it was taught to command and control. It was okay to not show emotion, to not talk about your mistakes and feelings. We had leaders like Jack Welsh and Steve Ballmer who were proponents of this form of leadership. And this was taught in MBA programs. And I have several stories in my book of leaders who were taught to be just like Jack Welsh, who worked for Jack Welsh. In fact, Fortune used to run a series of magazines on America's toughest bosses or the world's toughest bosses. And it was a badge of honor to be on the cover of that magazine, and it was a badge of honor to work for that kind of a boss. That was just the environment that we were a part of. And everybody expected it and respected it. And what happened is suddenly, especially post-pandemic, our environment around us suddenly changed. And so what you as a leader need to ask yourself is, are you willing to adapt and change based on how the environment around you changed? Or are you willing to stick to your old ways of doing things and risk the potential of dying off the same way that the butterfly did? So the value to you is simply being able to lead, being able to stay a leader, being able to become a leader, being able to adapt to lead in this new world of work that we're all a part of. I don't think this is a question of if we should lead this way. I think this is more of, are you going to lead this way or are you not going to lead at all? So that's my pitch to you just as an individual. Now there's also the value to the business, right? What's the ROI of doing this? And we looked at this in a couple different areas. So one of the things that we looked at is um, percentage of high quality leaders inside of organizations. And here what we found is that in organizations where leaders always lead with vulnerability when appropriate, the perception of leaders in those organizations as being high quality is extremely high. So... In organizations where vulnerability is not at all or rarely practiced, um, the percentage of leaders who are perceived as high quality is 56%, roughly half. In organizations where leaders always um, are embracing vulnerability, again, when appropriate, the percentage of high quality leaders in that organization is 86%, almost 90%. So we're talking about a 30% gap here between not at all or rarely versus always. And we see a gradual increase, right? From sometimes to often to always. And so basically, the more vulnerable your leaders are, the more they lead with vulnerability inside of their organizations, the more the leaders in that organization are perceived as being high quality. A couple other statistics for you to think about. Uh, We looked again at innovation, we looked at trust, we looked at uh, even inclusive cultures, um, a lot of different things across the board. So a couple statistics to highlight. Um, In organizations where the managers regularly display vulnerability again when appropriate, um, their uh, employees are almost three times as likely to be vulnerable with others at work. They're more than five times as likely to trust their managers they are almost three times as likely to engage in their roles in comparison or to be engaged in the roles in comparison to those uh, where organizations rarely or never display vulnerability. So again, we're looking at a 300% increase in engagement as a result of uh, increased vulnerability from leaders. Um, Almost four and a half times as likely to create an environment that's inclusive, uh, two and a half times as likely to be prepared to manage a remote, remote workforce, Uh, And again, the numbers across the board are like this. Uh, More than two times as likely to say that their senior leaders are willing to do what is right. And again, there are a few others in there, uh, almost two times as likely to develop novel ideas or solutions, aka innovation. So across the board, we see an ROI in terms of value to the business, not just in terms of value to you and why you should be doing it. Now, the shocking thing here is that when we ask these 14,000 employees, is vulnerability inside of your organization perceived as a leadership strength and not a weakness, less than 11% of people said definitely true. So less than 11% of 14,000 employees said, vulnerability is perceived as a leadership strength in my company and not a weakness. Definitely true. Less than 11%. The scary thing is that 34% said they didn't know. 34% of employees around the world said, I have no idea if vulnerability in my organization is a strength or a weakness, which means that if you don't know, guess what? You're not going to do it. 
And only 16% said that their leaders display qualities of vulnerable leadership often or always when appropriate. Less than 16%. That means the vast majority of leaders around the world are not willing to talk about their mistakes or failures. They're not willing to embrace uh, vulnerability or show a willingness to be emotionally vulnerable. That's a very scary environment for us to work in. You know, we keep talking about the rise of AI and automation and bots and technology. Most of us are working for bots as it is. <laughs> They're in human form. So it's kind of scary and interesting at the same time to see that we don't want to work for those types of leaders, yet most leaders are, for lack of a better word, robots. Now, um, the way that I think is helpful to frame why you need both of these elements and why both of these attributes are so crucial. Imagine a quadrant. A quadrant, it's got uh, obviously four parts to it. On the x-axis, you have leadership, and on the y-axis, you have vulnerability. Now, at the bottom left quadrant, you're obviously, you're not uh, leading yet, you're not vulnerable yet, you're kind of a novice, you're new in the role, you're trying to pick the path that you're gonna get. Now, let's say, for example, you are really good at the leadership piece, which I call the competence piece, right? You're really good at your job. You're really good at your job, you get promoted into a leadership role. And let's say I were to go talk to some of your employees and say, well, what do you think of this person as a leader? How would they respond about that? Well, they would probably say, oh, you know what? Um, Jacob is a really great leader. He's able to bring in a lot of money to the business. He's great at his job. He works really hard. Um, he's just really good at everything he does. But I don't have that chemistry with Jacob. I'm not engaged in the work that I'm doing. I don't feel that collaboration with Jacob. I don't feel that sense of engagement and motivation when I work with Jacob. Now, similarly, let's say you're really good at the vulnerability piece. You're really great at connecting with people, but you struggle in the competence area. And again, Somebody says, well, what do you think of working for this type of leader? And somebody's going to say, oh, you know what? Jacob's such a great person. I love working with Jacob. I'm engaged in my work. I feel motivated and engaged and inspired. We just have this great relationship, great chemistry. Jacob is awesome. But I'm not sure if Jacob is the right person to lead the team because Jacob hasn't demonstrated that he has what it takes to lead us. He hasn't demonstrated that he's actually good at his job. And so this is why you need both of these elements in place. Competence and connection leadership and vulnerability. This is what being a vulnerable leader is all about. This is why you need both of these things and not one. And unfortunately, inside of our organizations, we only focus on one, which is vulnerability. And again, vulnerability plus competence. So let's look at why, what this does. Um, I think a big part of this is it levels the playing field. Because what happens is, if you're a leader inside of an organization, you have to already acknowledge and respect that the people who work for you are already vulnerable to you. You can make their life hell at work if you wanted to. You could put them on difficult projects. You could demote them. You could, you know, you, you can mess with employees all you want. So they're already vulnerable to you. And everybody knows it. Everybody already knows it. We talk about it. It's very clear that employees are vulnerable to their leaders. If you have a leader, you are vulnerable to them. But the truth is that leaders are also vulnerable to their people. But we never talk about that. This is an implicit relationship that just doesn't get discussed. And the reason why leaders are vulnerable to their people is because if you think about it, if employees don't do their jobs, products don't get shipped, customers don't get served, you as a leader don't look good, your team doesn't function, your numbers go down. So you are actually very dependent on your employees just as much as they are dependent on you. The only difference is leaders never acknowledge that dependency. We don't talk about that vulnerability. It doesn't get addressed. So what ends up happening is by leading with vulnerability, you level the playing field. And when you level the playing field, you create that opportunity for collaboration, for trust, for engagement, for people to be on the same page. And this is why I think it's such a crucial and important aspect. Okay? And this is why, again, so important to be able to do that. You want to be able to get onto that level playing field. Now, um, one other thing that I think is important um, mentioning about competence, and I really, really want to stress this point. There's a concept in psychology called the Prattfall Effect. And the Prattfall Effect basically states that if you're good at your job and you're vulnerable, 
then what ends up happening is that people get a added positive perception of you. So somebody might say, oh, Jacob's really good at his job. Oh, now he's vulnerable. Now he's human. Oh, now he's even better at his job, right? That's how people perceive you. So if you're good at your job and you're vulnerable, you get an added boost, an added bump. If you are not good at your job and you are a, a mediocre employee, you're a C player, right? C minus, and you're vulnerable, what ends up happening is people will look at you and that vulnerability will justify and solidify and explain your mediocrity. So I'm not that great of an employee and I'm coming up to work and I'm vulnerable all the time talking about my employee, my, uh, talking to my team about all my challenges, mistakes, failures, personal stuff. What ends up happening is people are going to say, yeah, I get why Jacob is a C player. That makes sense. So you reinforce your mediocrity. Now then the question becomes, does this mean I can never be vulnerable? No. It means you need to add leadership to everything that you do. So let me give you another example just to kind of crystallize the importance of competence. Let's say you're a new leader. You just got promoted inside your company and you're asked to talk to your employees. What do so many leaders do? So many new leaders, what do they do? They go to their teams and they say, hey, my name's Jacob here. I'm a first time leader. I've never done this before. I'm so excited to be leading this team. I'm sure we're gonna have a great time. Um, and I think we're going to really just make some amazing things happen. It's very vulnerable, right? But you have to imagine the people who now work for me are kind of thinking like, what did Jacob just say? I, I don't have a lot of competence. Uh, I don't have a lot of confidence in that message Jacob just delivered. I feel like I could do Jacob's job. Why is he a leader? Now, how would you take that same situation and flip it around to lead with vulnerability? Instead, you would give that same message, but you would add leadership to it. And so a message might sound like this. Hey, my name's Jacob. I'm a first time leader here. I've never done this before. I'm so excited to be leading this team. Uh, here's what I'm gonna do to make sure that I can be the best leader that you've ever had. I actually have one of the seasoned leaders, uh, one of the seasoned leaders at this company is gonna be mentoring me and coaching me and just taking a look at some of the work that I'm doing to make sure that I'm moving in the right direction. I also have an executive coach that I'm gonna be working with who's gonna be giving me some feedback. He's probably gonna be talking to you and interviewing you and making sure that I'm moving in the right direction. Here are also three leadership book books that I'm gonna be reading. You can follow along with me if you want so that I can keep growing and learning and becoming the leader that you need me to be. That's a different message. I'm vulnerable. I also talked about what I'm doing to close the gap how I'm trying to get better, to learn, to grow, to become more competent. This is again, the critical aspect. So it doesn't mean that if you're doing something new, you can't be vulnerable. Sprinkle the leadership on top, right? Sprinkle the leadership on top. Now, let me tell you where you can begin. How do you start to lead with vulnerability? Now, the cover of the book, as you will see, is a mountain. It's a character climbing up a mountain. And this is very intentional. It's a very intentional and purposeful visual because vulnerability is like climbing a mountain, meaning that at the very bottom of the mountain, the base camp, it's pretty easy to take your first few steps. But then the higher up the mountain you go, the harder it becomes, the more challenging it becomes. You might fall, you might get bruised, you might make a mistake, you might have to go back down the mountain to go back up. But at the same time, the higher up the mountain you climb, the more people you meet on your journey, the more beautiful the vistas become, the farther out you can see, the more clarity you get. And this is why I use the visual of a mountain because that's how it goes, right? The higher up the mountain you go, the harder it becomes, but the more benefit that you ultimately start to see, the more connection you create with others. So where do you begin as you build your own mountain? So ask yourself, what's something that I can do tomorrow? What's something that I might be able to do in a week? Identify what is base camp for you and what's at the peak of the mountain for you? What's the scariest thing that you cannot imagine doing or sharing or exploring at your company? And once you identify base camp and once you identify what's at the peak of the mountain for you, then the next step is you simply begin to climb the mountain. So base camp might be something like sharing what I did over the weekend. Uh, Penny Pennington, the CEO of Edward Jones, a financial services company around 50,000 employees. She was very uncomfortable with even approaching vulnerability as a concept. And so she did what she calls keep an ace in her sleeve. And she knew that when she was gonna get in the elevator with some of her employees, 
that it was going to be weird if nobody talked to each other. So she kind of pre-planned at the beginning what she was going to say and that she was going to say something about her weekend and she was going to try to create that relationship and that bond with her employees. Again, that's how she started to approach it to get her to be comfortable with it. So that's her first, you know, baby step. All right, I'm getting into the elevator with employees. How can I just make a 30 second or a 20 second conversation where I'm connecting with somebody in there? And then maybe the peak of the mountain for you is sharing a personal challenge or struggle. Difficult relationship with a family member. Who knows, right? Who knows what that might be? Now, one thing that I want to caution as you climb this mountain, and one of the frameworks that I have in the book is called the vulnerability wheel. I don't advocate for simply sharing anything and everything with everyone. At the center of this vulnerability wheel is intention. Understanding what it is that you're sharing, why it is that you're sharing it, or What is it that you're going to do? Why is it that you're doing it? It needs to be, there there needs to be a reason behind it. Am I trying to create a better relationship with somebody? Am I trying to create an environment where employees are comfortable sharing ideas? Am I trying to drive innovation? Do I try to get people to collaborate and work together? Am I trying to give people insight into my thought process? What's the rationale? What's the intention behind your vulnerability? And again, whenever possible, you sprinkle the leadership piece on top of that. So the most important thing that I want to make sure everybody remembers is vulnerability plus leadership equals leading with vulnerability. Vulnerability plus leadership equals leading with vulnerability. Competence plus connection. There is no substitute for being good at your job. And the thing is, everybody knows what they need to do to be good at their job. There's no secret. If you're in marketing, would you know, take courses, get mentored. If you're in engineering, right, whatever you got to do, take courses. Again, get mentored, spend some extra time. You know what you need to do to be good at your job. There is no substitute for that. Mark Randolph, the former CEO of Netflix, when I interviewed him, he told me, I always do 10% more than what's asked. Do 10% more than what's asked. Do 5% more than what's asked. There's no substitute for competence because remember, if you don't have that competence and you're only vulnerable, it's going to end up hurting you. And the fascinating thing is we ask these 14,000 employees, what's the number one thing that's keeping you from leading with vulnerability at work? And the number one reason is actually embedded in that reason is the solution to the problem. I don't want to be perceived as being incompetent. That's why I'm not willing to be vulnerable at work. So how do you avoid the perception of being incompetent at work by being vulnerable? You add the competence to it. I'm vulnerable, but I'm adding competence to it. I'm adding leadership to it. I'm talking about what I learned. I'm talking about what I'm going to do. I'm talking about how I'm going to solve the problem, how I'm closing the gap. This is a unique part of being vulnerable at work. Because remember, we have a very different dynamic. We have a very different environment there. So my hope is that after listening to this, after watching this, after reading the book, you too will end up leading with vulnerability inside of your organization. You will combine leadership with uh, vulnerability, competence with connection in all the aspects of how you lead. And I really do believe that this will fundamentally transform how you lead, how you impact others. This is your greatest superpower, as it says on the cover of the book, unlock your greatest superpower to transform yourself, your team, and your organization. I think this is the number one thing that you could do, especially in the current environment as we're trying to lead through change. So if you want to not only succeed and thrive and excel in your career, but also be able to positively impact the lives of those around you, to drive business performance, to create trust, to again, lead through change and unlock the potential of those around you, then the way that you are going to be able to do that is to lead with vulnerability. If anybody has any questions, you can always learn more by grabbing a copy of the book, which I really hope you will do. Um, It is available everywhere you can find a book. You can head to leadwithvulnerability.com to grab some copies there uh, for yourself and hopefully for your team. You can go to Amazon. And I'll be sharing a lot more of this on the Substack community that we recently launched. And if you want to learn more about that, you can go to greatleadership.substack.com. Again, that's greatleadership.substack.com. 
Uh, you can email me if you if you have any questions. You want to challenge me on something? I'm totally fine. I don't expect everybody to uh, uh, take everything I say at face value. So challenge me. Ask me something. You can send me an email, Jacob at thefutureorganization.com. So thank you again for tuning in, for watching, and for listening. I really appreciate it.